Good to go. All right. Well, I'm recording. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to Christian Way Ministries, where we're leading God's people to the way to be saved. Welcome to session four of teaching intentional discipleship in an age of moral relativism. I am pumped up. I am excited about tonight's lesson. I think I'm pumped up every time I actually do get up here, but it feels like I get more, even more and more pumped up whenever the Lord gives me an opportunity to present a topic concerning his word. So I'm really excited that you guys were able to make it tonight. Um, as usual, we just have a couple of things we'd like to go over before we actually get into the meat of the course, but let us start off with a small prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for another day that you have made. We thank you for your grace upon grace. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father in heaven except through him. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, that you didn't leave us as orphans. So God, I shall decrease and you shall increase. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to receive today's teaching. May your Holy Spirit give me the words and be able to make the transitions and to make it clear to all of those who are present tonight. So God, I thank you so much for every door that you've opened, every door that you've closed. Lord, you know all of our needs before we even ask of them. And so Lord, I just pray that we will continue to keep our eyes on you, the author and finisher of our faith. So be with us this evening, Lord, be with all those that are present uh, in person and online, and also be with those, Lord, who wanted to make it this evening, but were unable to. So God, just saying a special prayer and blessing for them. We thank you. Forgive us of our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome again. Welcome again. Are you guys excited? I know it's what, 710 this evening, so I know it's a little late, but God bless you guys for your faith. God, I mean, it, it takes faith, right? It takes a, a, a mustard seed of faith to come get a teaching, uh, do, especially during the middle of the week. I know some of you have families and some of you have children that you left behind just to get this awesome teaching, this teaching that is very necessary in our day and age today. Praise the Lord. So here, just a couple of things real quick. Announcements again, as you guys know, we'll be doing this course until March 16th, every Tuesday. We are on week four. So that means after tonight, we have four weeks left, okay? Uh, participants will receive a certificate of completion. So right around week seven, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass out a sheet and I wanna make sure I get your name spelled the right way. So then this way, when we do issue out those certificates, we'll have your name, you know, the way it needs to be on those certificates, okay? And everybody should have received a free book on the complete guide of discipleship. If you haven't, I know First Lady is looking at me over there with the nonverbals. First Lady, we're ordering those uh, some more. Uh, so then this way, those that don't have it will receive a free copy. Um, and if anybody's online hasn't received it, please let us know so we can get you a book out as well. And also the questionnaire, many of you have already filled it out. So I think we're good to go on that. And again, this course is voluntary. Okay, we're not forcing you to come. It's on your free will and it's being recorded. Okay, so if you have questions or whatever, just know you on live, okay, and everybody can hear you. There's no such thing as a dumb question, by the way, amen? All right, praise the Lord. All right, so last week, what did we go over? We went over why it is important to know your history. As I said before, history matters. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, history, it matters. It matters. And as you guys saw last week, when we were going over all of the historical formulations, how many of you guys really knew all of those things that did happen to bring us to where we are today? So history matters. And a lack of knowledge is destroying the people of God. And, and many people don't know these things. So that's why history matters. And I know history can be dry. I used to hate history. It wasn't until about maybe 10 years ago that I really started to have a desire to learn more about history. And now I feel like I'm a history buff, but there's so much history out there, so much to learn. You're talking about 5,000 years of recorded history. That's a lot of history, okay? And I don't think I'll ever in one lifetime be able to learn it all. Um, we also talked about Satan and the spiritual battle. We're continuing to unmask that spiritual battle. We're, we're continuing to, uh, to bring to light 
the tactics of the enemy and how he's out to seek, kill, and destroy. So we talked about that. We also talked about moral relativism, the difference between absolute truth and relative truth. And absolute truth of God's word matters. Look, the presupposition should be God's word is the truth. It's the ultimate authority on matters pertaining to truth and morality. If you don't start off with that premise, then everything becomes relative. Everything becomes questionable. So if you don't start with God's word being inerrant, meaning it's without flaw, okay, without error, then everything afterwards is relative. Everything can be questioned. Everything can be twisted and manipulated. So you have to start off with that premise that God's word is the ultimate authority on truth and matters pertaining to what's right and what's wrong, okay? So we talked about that, but look at this. There's an article here that I'm gonna turn your attention to and I'll see if I can navigate through this here uh, for my online viewers. And this is a recent article that came out that I will cite on my thesis. And it's called Moral Relativism is the Majority Opinion of This Generation. Okay, new study reveals. So just some statistics that I would like to show you here. Um, a new report from the Barna Group in, in partnership with the Impact 360 Institute collected data from about 1,500 participants of teens and young adults between the ages of 13 to 21 uh, between June 15th and July 17, 2020. So this is about a six month old survey that was just conducted. Now look at this. If we, if we scroll down here, it says additionally, 31% of teens and young adults strongly agree, check this out, that what is morally right and wrong changes over time. So 31% so of teens and young adults don't even believe in absolute truth. They believe truth can change over time. So what used to be called truth then, now uh, it's different now, it's evolved, it's changing, all right? And then it says, uh, based on society, compared to just 25% in 2018, and another 43% agree somewhat. So the numbers are even increasing as to how many people believe truth changes over time. All right. And then we scroll down and look at this statistic. Just 10% of young people surveyed strongly disagree that what is morally right and wrong changes over time based on society. So there's only a small segment, a small remnant of the population that absolutely agree that truth does not change. That's 10% of the, so that's only 150 people out of those 1500 people that were surveyed believe in absolute truth. This is our generation today. This is a new report. And I, I don't know if there was anything else that I wanted to quote here on this, uh, on this article, but those were just a few statistics as to where we are as a country and as a culture today regarding you know, the belief of absolute versus relative truth. So let me see if I can navigate back over. Bam, look at that. Watch out now, I'm getting good at this. I'm getting good at this. All right, so we also talked about last week, you know, America's religious landscape. At the very beginning of the founding of our country, what did we say the statistics were? 99% Protestant, okay? And the other 1% consisted of Jews and Catholics, Catholics, right? So primarily our country was majority, 99% Christian compared to what today? Only 30% identify as practicing Christians. That's incredible. Less than 70% claim some kind of religious affiliation. So while Christianity is declining, all other religions are inclining. Islam, what else is inclining? Atheism, agnosticism, all of these other isms that we're gonna get into here in a few minutes. And then we talked about the series of events that led to America's moral relativism. We talked about all of those Supreme Court cases. And I know Tiff, she's in that field of, of law and she operates uh, at, a, at, a, um, at a legal office, you know, so she deals with that kind of stuff. So I'm sure that part of the lesson last week was pretty interesting, but there was a series of Supreme Court precedences that took place that led us to where we are today. The elimination of prayer and Bible reading and the Ten Commandments, uh, the, 
the, the mandate for contraceptives, which allowed Wade and Roe to take place in 1973, where now 63 million babies have been aborted since then. These are all issues that have contributed to our moral relativism today. The, the, the elimination of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, that Bill Clinton signed, that has now been scratched out. So now even homosexuality has become legal. So these things that were illegal before, okay, are now legal today. What used to be called truth then is now relative, it's changed. So we talked about that. And then we talked about the results of all that we discussed up to this point that led to where we are as a country and as a church today. So what to expect this week? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? What to expect this week? Okay. We are going to continue to re-emphasize the importance of this course, teaching intentional, intentional, key word, intentional. The reason why we are where we are is because we have been unintentional with discipleship, unintentional with the Great Commission, unintentional with preaching the unadulterated gospel. And because of that, our country is going in the direction that it's going. We're going to review some literature. I just have two books for you today. We're going to talk about worldly versus godly traditions. Uh-oh. Meaning of being a new creation in Christ. What does that mean? Why teaching intentional discipleship is the ultimate solution. There's a little grammar error. This relative truth influenced the church to accept. I don't know why that's there. We need to eliminate that. And spiritual contributions to the statement of problem, worldly philosophy. So today's teaching will expound on how believers need to understand that history matters. The absolute truth of God's word matters examine their own philosophies and traditions to ensure they are in alignment with the truth. Watch out for worldly philosophies and re-emphasizing the necessity of teaching intentional discipleship. Praise the Lord. So before I move on, I got a couple of warnings. Warnings, warnings, okay? Warnings. The truth is offensive to those who do not believe it. It is, it is, okay? And Jeremiah was on to something, okay? He says, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so they cannot hear the word of Yahweh is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. So it's important when it comes to learning that we set our feelings and our emotions to the side. It's important that we be led by the truth, by the truth of history, by the truth of God's word. And we have to understand that not everybody is going to agree with that truth. And some of them are going to find certain things offensive. That's just the nature of humanity. You know, when it comes to things that we don't agree with, we tend to close up because we don't want the truth. We don't want to change. We want to remain in our own way of thinking. And it's important for believers to deny themselves, right? To pick up their cross and follow Jesus. So that's a warning. Some of the truth that's going to be presented in this course and has already been presented may be offensive. And it's not intentional. Let me tell you, I don't intend to offend anybody. Okay, with the teaching that I am presenting. So I just wanted to make that known. Another thing, repetition. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Okay, we're going to repeat certain things over and over and over and over again. It's important. Okay, and I'm not just doing repetition just because I grabbed it out of the thin blue sky. No, look what Paul said to the Philippian church. He says, finally, my brothers rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. Okay. So certain things that Paul spoke to the churches, he had to repeat them multiple times because as he says, it is going to be a safeguard for you. So in this course, you're gonna find me repeating certain things over and over and over again, such as the necessity of teaching intentional discipleship in the culture that we live in today. I guarantee you, I will say that at least one time in each session, okay, okay. 
All right, so I think I got the warnings out the way. Awesome, awesome. So review of literature, Diedrich von Hoffner, The Cost of Discipleship. Now this is a very familiar book on discipleship that was written, Lord, I think it was written during the time of World War II. Yep, yep, 1959, I believe. But this is a really good book and I quote this book multiple times in my thesis and I will be quoting it this evening. And then another one called The Great Omission. The Great Omission by Dallas Willard. It was written in 2006, so it's about 15 years old now, but another great book that clarifies some of the misconceptions uh, regarding the Christian faith. And I'll be quoting him tonight as well. Awesome. I got many more books where that came from, but for the sake of time, you know, I can only go over a couple. I remember in the first course, and I said, I, oh, the second course, I said, I need to do a review of literature. So I had a whole stack. And Ellie was like, no, you can't go over that whole stack. I had like 15 books. She's like, I had to break it down. I said, well, I guess you have a point there. So I had to break it down. I had to listen. I had to listen. I had to listen. Be quick to, it says, be, be uh, what is it? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And I know for some, first lady, don't, 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 don't be coming for me talking about some, mm. See, some, I don't, you know, I can't with her right now. So, <laughs> so what's the point? What's the point of all of this, right? What's the point? Why am I here, Pastor? Why am I sacrificing my time to come to this course? Well, to bring awareness again to the statement of problem. Houston, we have a problem. And that problem is our country and the church is spiritually and morally declining according to the statistics. We have a problem. That's part of the point. Another part of the reason why you're here is to defend the reason why the Great Commission is the only true answer to our spiritual and moral dilemma. That's the point. To unmask, again, the spiritual battle of Satan and his army to bring awareness, as we did last week, to the historical formulations that led to America's moral relativism. That's the point. To make, look, true disciples of Jesus Christ in our world today. That has to probably be the ultimate point that I'm trying to get to you guys and those that are online and whoever would run across this teaching. True followers. Now notice I said true true followers of Jesus Christ and to advocate for the absolute truth of God's word versus the relative truth of the world. That's the point. Any questions so far? Oh, and obviously the last bullet there to ensure obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice, right? Amen. To God's word over obedience to your tradition. Now, this is going to be a key part of our next segment of this lesson. So I'm going to ask you a question. Matter of fact, my slide is going to ask you a question. What does it say up there? Right. Are you following traditions or are you following God's commands? Are you truly following Jesus as his disciple and being obedient to his gospel? Or are you following your own truth, your own family traditions, your own feelings, your own ways, your own interpretation of what God's word says versus the author's intent of the word, your own philosophies, your own way of thinking. Are you following the American gospel? Be careful for the American gospel. Are you following relative truth versus absolute truth? Or are you following Satan's clever lies? What are you following? Many of us think we're following Jesus, but not knowing we're following other things too.
And look what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 3. So important. He was talking to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were what? They were religious leaders. They knew the word. They had their stuff together, right? And he tells them this. And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? And so I believe this is a problem with many believers today. That at the same, as, as, as they're following their own traditions, they're nullifying the word of God at the same time. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know I was raised in a Puerto Rican household, okay? And our family tradition was that you stayed within the race, that you were Catholic, and that you were Democrat. That was my family. I'm just being honest, okay? And let me tell you that through the years, I bucked on every one of those traditions. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I, why did I buck on it? Well, first I was just a rebellious child by nature anyway. Um, but then the more I got into God's word, the more I let his truth transform me, the more I became informed by his word instead of my own traditions. You know, so you know what? At the end of the day, yes, I broke family tradition. But what was more important, to be obedient to the tradition or to be obedient to God's word? I had to choose today whom I shall serve. And that's God and his word. That means everything about me has been transformed through and through. Who I was 10 years ago is a completely different person today. And I can go on a whole spill on what I used to be, but not today, okay? I'm gonna I'm save y'all today. But look at this other verse right here. First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven through eight. And Paul says, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, a new loaf, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the feast. Now the Jews had the feast, the festival of unleavened bread. So they had to cook bread without any leaven in it, okay? So Paul is using this same festival to give them an analogy, a description on how they are to participate in this festival, but from a spiritual sense, not from a physical sense, right? He says, let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, okay? So what happens when you get a little leaven in it, it corrupts the whole batch. So we have to be careful with the leaven of sin with the leaven of worldly philosophies, with the leaven of tradition, because it will mess up the whole batch. We have to be careful with that. I know if any of you are into painting and you go to Lowe's, right? And you have to go get new paint. Well, sometimes you have to get the five gallon or you get the one gallon, okay? So when they go and put whatever color you want in that white bucket of paint, they put it in the machine and guess what? They only add a couple of drops or whatever color paint that you need into the paint. It only takes a few drops. Then they shake it up in this machine and next thing you know, voila, you got your color. Well, the same thing with leaven, with sin, with traditions, with philosophies. If you let just a few drops in your life, what happens? It consumes you and it spreads like a disease. And next thing you know, you're caught up in these philosophies and these traditions and only the Lord can break them because you're so caught up in them that no matter what anybody else says, no matter the truth, no matter history, nothing is going to break them. David, we have a question. With that. Yes, ma'am. We have a question. Go ahead. Paula, go ahead. We have a question. One second. I can't unmute her, so she has to unmute herself. Well, Miss Paula, if you can, write your question down in the um, chat so we, can, um, so we can ask that question and we'll just continue to move on. You have to unmute yourself. I know the technology is difficult 
to um, to work. So let her let her um, or either text me, Miss Paula. You can text me your question, and we'll ask it um, here in a, in a few moments. Okay. So we have to be careful with that leaven, with that sin, with that tradition, with those philosophies, which we're going to get into because it can't corrupt the whole batch. All right. Look, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. I'm, I'm afraid that we quote this a lot, but we don't apply this. Okay. It's like, it's opposite of, we just moved in October of last year okay we moved into a new house right and it's beautiful praise god but we moved a lot of our us old stuff from the old house into the new house so it's it's opposite of this you don't you don't you don't take from your old life into your new life in christ you leave your old way of thinking your old traditions and flaw, whatever it was that was in your past now you have been made new in christ but what I'm afraid is that believers want to be new in Christ, but keep their past with them and keep the same baggage with them. God is calling you to a new life, a new life. You want to be a disciple? You must be born again. You have to be made new. That's the only way. We're talking about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And part of that is being a new creation, being transformed in his image and after his likeness. Not what you want yourself to be, but what God wants you to be. Our prayer should be, God, implant your desires in my heart. Right? We should be transformed into his image, not what we want to see ourselves as. Look. And Jesus, and, and look, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter three, another religious leader who knew the word of God, who had his stuff together as well. And Jesus says, look, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom unless they are born again. It's the only way you can see the kingdom. You must be born again by the truth and by what? By his spirit. That's it. But I'm afraid we don't really understand what this really means and apply it. And because of that, many lukewarm Christians are being produced right here in America. So we're going to get into some spiritual contributions to the statement of problem that we've been dis discussing the past few weeks. Okay, look what's going on. Not enough disciples making disciples. That's what it is. The church is not in the business of making disciples right now. Not all churches, many churches in America today, because I'm not going to put the whole church under one umbrella. We do have some amazing ministries out there that are in the business of making disciples and exercising the Great Commission. Praise the Lord. But because there are not enough disciples making disciples, what's happening? That there's a manufacturing, a manufacturing uh, of lukewarm Christians. That's part of the problem. Another thing, new creatures holding on to old ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Christians who haven't been born again by the Holy Spirit. Another one. Yeah. Go ahead, minister. Uh, uh, another one. Churches conforming to the patterns of the world, not teaching the true meaning of discipleship. Spiritual contributions to the statement of problem. Satan influencing believers, they can be Christian without total transformation, without total surrender, without total obedience to God's word. Thinking you can enter into the kingdom of God and live how you want to live. No, that's contrary to God's word. Jesus says, be holy as my father in heaven is holy. That's a command. Traditions over obedience to the absolute truth. Who are you following today? What are you following? We have to examine our whole life. When Paul says examine yourselves to make sure you're living according to the faith, examine your whole life, examine your way of thinking, examine those philosophies, examine those traditions, those family traditions. Some family traditions aren't godly traditions. Let's keep it real. Okay. Hearing the truth without applying the truth. 
That's part of the spiritual contribution to the statement of problem. We hear it, but what happens? It goes through one ear and comes out the other. Uh-huh. And look what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. are you a wise man wise. or are you a fool? Uh-oh. <laughs> it's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Look, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell like a great crash. And my, one of my favorite analogies to this particular scripture is the three little pigs. Y'all know about that story, right? The first pig uh, had his house built with what? With straw. And the wolf came and blew up on that house and fell with a great crash. Then the next little pig built a house with sticks. Y'all know the story. huh? And the wolf came, blew up on that house, and it fell with a great crash. But the third pig said, you know what? I'm going to build my house on the foundation, on the rock. And so when the wolf came, he blew on that house and didn't crash. Why? Because his foundation was built on the rock. It was solid. And not only that, at the end of the story, the wolf tries to get smart and go through the chimney of the brick house. But the pig had the boiling pot ready for dinner. So when the wolf went in, he went in the pot and they had a feast. Isn't that amazing? See what I'm saying? I don't know. I don't know if I said the story completely right, but I know it's something like that. You know, so some something like that. It's something like that, okay? So we're gonna just keep it moving. You can keep it moving. There's it's important that when we hear the truth, when we get the word, when we get the lesson, we have to apply it. We have to be built on the rock, on the foundation of God's word, the absolute truth. Amen. David. Right. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it's really about the traditions that you were talking about, how we had spoken a little bit last week, how not all traditions are bad, but the question mostly is how when you become a new Christian, how when you become new in faith, how you can change in order to get rid of some of the traditions that you have that cause you to become lukewarm in Christ? Well, the, the answer to that, I'm going to try to simplify it. What are some ways to get rid of old traditions and old patterns and old ways of thinking? Well, first, praying that the Holy Spirit will convict our heart of whatever it is that's not of God, okay? That we understand what those traditions and those philosophies are that are not of God and measuring them. And we're going to talk about that. I mean, we're getting a little hand in my lessons here, but we're going to talk about how we can get rid of those traditions and how we can examine them to see if they measure up with God's word. We're going to talk about that. So, and, and then, and then last but not least repentance, repentance. So when you get convicted, when you understand that you're following out the things that are not of God, repenting and confessing that sin and turning the other way and not going back to it anymore. All right. That's it. That's it. I hope that answers your question, but we're going to get into it a little bit more as we continue on in the lesson. So do you know what it means to be a lukewarm? Are you lukewarm? You need to examine yourself. Those that are online and receiving this teaching, examine yourself. Are you lukewarm? Okay. Because we know what Jesus says to one of the churches in Revelation that he wished that you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, he's going to spit you right out of his mouth. And the commentary on this here, I thought this was pretty interesting too, regarding the analogy Jesus uses for lukewarm. In Revelation 3.16, it says, in Colossae, located 10 miles east of Lasodia, had plenty of, uh, had plenty of cold, pure drinking water, while the hot springs of Herapolis, located six miles north of La Laosidea, were famed for their healing power. 
Laos Sadia lacked its own water supply and its solution was inadequate. Water flowing in by the aqueduct arrived and contaminated by minerals. Uh, Jesus rebukes the complacent church for not offering life or healing to its community. So he understood his own context you know, of his time and his and his day. And he used the analogy of lukewarm to describe those who were not being obedient to him. So I just love that that small commentary that my study Bible has. And if you don't have a study Bible, I highly encourage you to get one. OK, that has some additional notes on some of the verses of scripture that you may not have a full understanding about. All right. So. When it comes to the spiritual contributions to the statement of problem, we talked about a list of those. But here go another one that we must pay special attention to. You're ready? And it's already there for you. Be aware of what? Deadly. I like this slide because these philosophies are deadly as to the results that it brings. So we have to be careful with these deadly doctrines. And there are many of them. So many that I can't name them all. I would need a whole year to probably go over all the deadly doctrines that exist in our world today. And Paul says this, see to it in Colossians 2.8 that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit that's according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. This is huge stuff right here. This is explosive. Like we have a prescription. We have the antidote. We have a guide to help us in our own life today. But how many of us are really meditating on the word day and night? and really learning what the word says about these matters. And so what is philosophy? Anybody know? What is philosophy? Huh? We talk about philosophy all the time. I know my kids sometimes will say a word and then I'd be like, oh, that's a good question. What is a boot? Or what is a door? They'd be like, yo, what is a, um, they asked me something the other day and I was just like, Man, that's a good question. I had to go back to the dictionary. I know what it means, but I couldn't describe it. I couldn't articulate it to them. They asked the simplest questions, but I'm like, man, that's a good question, believe it or not. And I just didn't. So sometimes I have to go look it up. But what is philosophy? So I took a picture of philosophy right out of the Webster's Dictionary, okay? Right out of the Webster. You're welcome, by the way. All right. Okay. And it says all learning exclusive of technical precepts and practical arts, the sciences and liberal arts exclusive of medicine, law and theology, a doctor of philosophy of such and such, four year college course of a major seminary, physical science, ethics, a discipline compri compromising, uh, comprising as its core logic, aesthetics, Ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology, a pursuit, here we go, of what? A wisdom. Uh, what does that sound like? Sounds like gnosticism, right? Uh, trying to obtain a deeper knowledge, a deeper wisdom, going beyond the word, a pursuit of wisdom, a search for a general understanding of values and reality by chiefly speculative rather than observational means an analysis of the grounds of and concepts expressing fundamental beliefs, a system of philosophical concepts, a theory, and many of these isms or theories underlying or regarding a sphere of activity or thought, the most basic beliefs, concepts, and attitudes of an individual or group, and then philosophy of life right underneath it, an overall vision of or attitude toward life and the purpose of life. So philosophy really a way of thinking about something, right? That's my philosophy. That's your philosophy. We all have philosophies. We all have opinions, but there's only one absolute truth. So those philosophies and those opinions have to be measured with that absolute truth, okay? But what is philosophy according to the Greek New Testament Bible? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, saints. So here we go. So, you know, I like to go to uh, this blue letter Bible. And I always like to go to the original language and pull up what it means. And so here we go. 
Let me see. Can I play the sound? Normally I can play. Here we go. Listen. Philosophia. Strong's G, 5385. Philosophia. 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 So that's that's a pretty easy one to 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 recite in the Greek. So I won't have no problem doing that. All right. And then here, let's see here, view entry. So look at this here. Philosophy denotes the love and pursuit of wisdom. Hence, philosophy, the investigation of truth and nature in the so-called philosophy of false teachers. Though essentially Greek as a name and as an idea, it had found its way into Jewish circles. Josephus speaks of three Jewish sects as the philosophies. It is worth observing that this word, which to the Greek denotes the highest effort of the intellect, occurs here alone in Paul's writing. So it's a pursuit of wisdom. That's what it is. All right. And sometimes that pursuit of wisdom goes beyond God's word. So just wanted to give you a little small crash course on that. Now back to this here. Now, now I want to go back a couple of slides. Look what Paul says. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Okay? So be careful with philosophy. That's not centered on Christ. And remember the isms. There's a lot of isms. Yo, this list keeps on growing. Okay, so this little, this little triangles from one all the way to, up to the stars are all the isms we went over past couple of weeks. Liberalism, okay, secularism, progressivism, postmodernism, subjectivism, moral relativism. Gnosticism, age of enlightenment. And we talked about pantheism, okay? And identifies God with the universe. Everything is God and, and God is in everything. Okay, and then I got a couple more. Universalism, universalism, okay? So you gotta say these things real slow. And what is that? All paths lead towards the same God. Haven't he heard? There's more, there's more than one way to God. I mean, that's such a popular view today. There's more than one way to God. Be careful with that. Okay? It's a deceiving lie. Jesus was very clear in John 14, 6. What does he say? I am the way, the truth, the light. I am the way and the truth and, and the light. light. No one can come to the Father except, except there's only one way. The mm. only way to the cross is through Jesus Christ. That's it. So be careful with that. Then atheism, we talked about that. Belief in no God or no belief in the supernatural. Naturalism, be careful with this. A part of a second naturalism is a, a Wiccan, the Wiccan religion that worships nature. Belief in nature over a supreme God who created nature, mother nature. How many people got mother nature this, mother nature that? Well, what does it say mother nature in God's word? Oh, yeah, exactly. Think about it. Communism, uh-oh. It's hard to have a conversation about moral relativism in our country today and not speak anything about politics. They do go hand in hand, even though the world wants to separate faith from government, just can't do it. Communism is a political and economic doctrine that aims to replace private property with public ownership and communal control of at least the major means of production, i.e. socialism, a synonym to that. These are isms we must know. Humanism. Look at this emphasis on the goodness of humanity versus the goodness of God. And Paul says in Romans 3.11, what does he say? So, so all of this emphasis on the goodness of humanity over the goodness of God is contrary to the word of God. In Romans 3.11, Paul says, and he quotes, there is none righteous. Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even me. Okay? And then Jesus, in Matthew 19, I believe to the rich young ruler, when, when he approaches him, in verse 17, 
Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. So this philosophy and this doctrine out here that emphasizes the goodness of man, contrary to the scripture, because it says we all fall short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is death. There's no one that's good. There's only one. And who is that? God alone, Jesus Christ. And look at this. I, I got another, another link here. When it comes to humanism, there was a manifesto, a manifesto that was developed in 1933. Look at what this manifesto says. And this is part of the doctrine of atheism. Look at this. They have their own creed. They have their own, they have their own scripture, humanistic scripture. And look at this. First, religious human, uh, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Okay, look at this. Humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of continuous process. This is humanism. This is the doctrine of humanism. Holding an organic view of life, humanists find that the traditional dualism of mind and body must be rejected. <laughs> humanism recognizes that man's religious culture and civilization is clearly depicted by anthropology, the study of man, and history are the product of gradual development due to his interaction with his natural environment and with his social heritage, completely exiling God out of the equation. It's all about humanity. Religion consists of those actions and seven and experiences which are humanly significant. Nothing human is alien to the religious and includes labor, art, science, philosophy, love, friendship, blah, blah, blah. Look, re religious humanism considers the complete realization of human personality to be the end of man's life and seeks its development and fulfillment in the here and now. And, and it just goes on and on and on about their own doctrine and their own humanism. So I'm not gonna read it all, just wanted to give you a little snapshot of some of the doctrines that exist in our world today and what people are actually following. But how many of us really even know any of this stuff, right? So moving on, be aware with these isms and philosophies because they are not of God. And as I said before, they are all dressed up to deceive people into thinking they're advancing humanity for the better, but they're ultimately undercutting morality for the worse and influencing people away from the truth of God's word. That's what it's all there for. It's dressed up pretty, okay, to lure you in. That's exactly like Satan, as we said last week, masquerades as an angel of light. So he wants to dangle these little philosophies and traditions. He wants to dress them up real nice so we can lure you in. That's his whole agenda. And one of those philosophies, one of those philosophies that has caused deadly consequences, believe it or not, was Karl Marx's uh, communist, communist manifesto that he wrote in 1848. And who would have ever thought that his philosophy would lead to the slaughter of millions of people? Millions. So here go another ism, Marxism, Marxism. And this one is very prevalent in our society today. And it's masked in a way that people don't even know it. They can't identify it. And it's a political philosophy developed by Karl Marx. It derives from the communist manifesto of 1848. It's a critique against capitalism, an economic system conducted off free trade and private ownership, limited government. So that's what Marxism is. It is an attack against free market and capitalism. That's what our country was built on, free market and capitalism. We wanted limited government. Why? Because we understood from Karl Marx's philosophy and all these other movements that occurred that tried to follow this philosophy fail. And we're gonna talk about some of those movements in a second, okay? Clash between the bourgeois, go ahead and say bourgeois, bourgeois, okay? Bourgeois and the proletariat. 
the proletariat, the proletariat, the working class, the bourgeois, the middle class, the one who own the private land and the wealth versus the working man, okay? The bourgeois. Now I try to pronounce every letter in that word and I ended up botching the whole thing. So I had to go to dictionary.com and actually pressing on the little button that pronounces it for you. And I said, my goodness, I had that all wrong. The bourgeois, go ahead say bourgeois, the bourgeois. Okay, so it's a clash. That's what Marxism is, a clash. It's a clash. It's a, it's a, a, a abolition of individual rights. So no, no individual, you have no rights. You have no rights, that's Marxism. You get rid of all your individual rights. It promotes total government, total control over communications. Hello, what do we have going on today? Censorship is real right now. People are losing their channels right off Facebook. If you have any type of conservative ideals, guess what? It, does, it, it, it goes against their philosophy. And guess what? Big tech, social media, a lot of them are being ran by some of these philosophies we've been talking about. So look, that's what Marxism is. Total control over everything. Communication, transportation, labor, finances, edu education. Our public education is being ran by who? Government. Well, there is no difference. Communism comes out of Marxism. Communism was influenced by Marxism. We're gonna get into that in just a second. Control of property. So this is what Marx, this is the ideology. And it has infiltrated our country. I could go into so much more, so much more. So how, so how do we test for these worldly philosophies? Hmm. Good question, right? How do we test against them? How do we test against them? First John chapter four, if you have your Bibles, pull these out. Pull these out. First John chapter four. First John chapter four. How can we test against these philosophies, these traditions? Going back to Ms. Paula's question earlier. How do we get rid of it? How can we identify it? It's really a simple answer, to be honest, which is really simple. And in, in the very first verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, dear brothers, dear sister, dear Christian Way Ministries, dear our online viewers who are present today, it says, do not believe every spirit, but test. You see the magnifying glass is up there to magnify these four words, but test the spirits, test them. Our battle is all spiritual. So all of this stuff that's going on is spiritual. So we have to test these spirits, okay? To see whether they are from God, because why? Many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many, many, there's so many out there. Only God knows how many false prophets there are. <laughs> I don't have enough fingers and toes, okay? And then look, 1 John 4, the next verse, 2 and 3. By this, you will know the spirit of God. By this, you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. This is how we know the difference between the true spirit of God and the false spirit of Satan. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. It's not of God. And this is the spirit of who? The Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist is already present, is in present. Okay? The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's full blown right now, if you ask me. So it's simple saying, how can I test these philosophies? Well, go to the philosophy themselves. Go to the founder of these philosophies and ask them this one question. Do they confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is, has come in the flesh? That he is God, that he is the Messiah. 
Do they make these confessions? Are they are their philosophies built around the Son of God? If they're not, I'm afraid we have to question them. I'm afraid we have to draw up a red flag and raise our eyebrow at them. I'm not saying we can't glean for any from any secular work or anything that doesn't confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. But what we're saying here, according to the scripture, is that if they don't confess it, if this is not their foundational belief system, man, you got to watch out for them. You got to be careful with them because many of them have gone out into the world and their mission is to do what? To deceive people, to seek, kill, and destroy. It's that simple. I put a little moving picture up there. It's just that simple. It's not complicated. It's simple. If they do, if they do not confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you know, watch out. It could be a very false philosophy because their whole mind, their whole, their whole worldview and framework is not built on Christ. It's built on the world. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a good question. You, repeat. Well, how do you deal with individuals that are being led by these false spirits and by these false doctrines and these false philosophies? Well, you can only warn them about them. You can only bring the scriptures to them and say, hey, look, you got to be careful with these things because these things are not centered on God. And all you could do is warn them and preach about it. But after so many times, you just have to let it go because guess what? They don't want to know the truth. And when they don't want to know the truth, there's nothing you can do about it. I think there's a passage in Titus somewhere that says, if you warn them once, warn them twice, and after the third time, that's it. Do away with them. Shake the dust off your feet if they're not willing to listen to the truth. And that's the problem today, that many are not willing to listen to the truth of God's word. Okay, so look, the answer is simple. When it comes to investigating these philosophies, is Jesus Christ the center of them? If they're not, we have to be careful with them. Okay, and look, the very last verse, look at this, the last two verses in the same chapter. And the KJV here, this was the best picture I can pull up, but I, I, really, I really wanted to put this on the screen for you guys. In verse four, it says, ye are of God. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. You have overcome these philosophies. You have overcome these false spirits and false prophets that have gone into the world because greater is he, Jesus Christ, that is in you than he that is in the world. And the world, okay, they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world and the world heareth them. Meaning those false spirits, those false prophets are of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not of us. So sister, to your question, you are of God. That other person may not be of God. So guess what? They're not going to listen to you because you are of God and they are not. It's that simple. It's that simple. <laughs> yes. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Give Nikita a round of applause there. God is good. I, I, there is something about just walking the walk as a Christian. And, at this, at, at, and sometimes your walk will speak for itself to the point where people are like, man, she's really forgiven. She's really loving. She has a really godly attitude. And I just, maybe I need to go to church and get some of that spirit she got. Okay, yes, Dennis. Titus 3. Titus 3. 9 through 11. And um, let, let's, let's, let's read that. I appreciate that, brother. Titus 3, 9 through 11. It says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful and they are self-condemned. Maybe we have a question. 
Yes. Go ahead, Frankie. Hey, uh, David, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I just wanted to open up with a quote, then a question. As okay. Christians, I challenge you to have a great aim. Have a high standard. Make Jesus your idol. Make him an idol not to merely be admired, but also to be followed. My question was um, the um, philosophy in the church. You know, I spoke to really good Christians, and they don't believe in the rapture. And I was wondering if you, if you could shed some light on that. <laughs> yeah, the, the rapture is a doctrine that, again, there's two sides of the coin. Some believe the rapture, some don't believe in it. Some believe it happened at a certain time, some believe that happened at another time. It is a secondary doctrine. Um, it is a secondary doctrine. I believe that at some point, Christ will rapture the church. When that will be, no one knows the time nor the hour. So we can't get but so caught up in when Jesus Christ is going to come back and rapture the church. It's a secondary doctrine. What we need to be focused on, and this is what the enemy does, he tries to have the church focus on matters and doctrines that are secondary to our salvation. You know, what we need to be focused on is making disciples, exercising the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded to go ye there for. So because, because we live in a dying world, right? So salvation and eternity are on the line and we know that hell is a real reality. So while many are caught up with when the rapture is going to come, when the second coming is going to come, it's taking their minds off of what we really need to be focused on. You know what I'm saying? Once Jesus ascended back to the father in heaven, okay, he sent the disciples to do what? To go and preach the gospel to all nations and make disciples, that's our mission, that's our command. When Jesus is gonna come and rapture the church, we can have a theological conversation until the sun turns dark. What's that going to solve? Whose life is it going to save? You know, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Mr. Frankie. Uh, we can get more into eschatology, the study of the last times, and there are many different views concerning it. Um, so we could talk a little bit more offline about that question there. Sound good? Thumbs up, David, he gave you. Okay, thumbs up. Per perfect, 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 perfect. So so look at this. Look, Timothy, Timothy and, and Paul writes this letter to Timothy. There was a, already false doctrines circulating in church in the first century. And Paul gives Timothy this command, watch your life and watch your doctrine closely. Watch these things. Because just a little bit of leaven, just a little bit of lies, okay, can corrupt the whole batch. So you must watch these things very closely. And any doctrine, any philosophy, tradition that does not exalt Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're not of God. The scripture is clear on that. It's that simple. Yeah. Okay. Look what Jesus said. Jesus says, look, beware of false prophets which come to you in what? In sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raving wolves. So even Jesus multiple times speaks about false prophets, false Christ, false apostles coming into the world that we must be careful with them. Watch these philosophies, all of these philosophies. Somebody talk about the universe. Does the universe exalt Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If they don't, oh, nah, hey, hey, look, I can't, hey, look, I love you, but I can't side with you on that one. Because I believe in the absolute truth of God's word. Okay? And look at the dangers. Look at the dangers of these false doctrines. Bringing in a little history real quick. And I got four slides, four pictures right here. Look at this. On the top left, top left, okay, we have Vladimir Lenin, okay, that was influenced by Karl Marx's philosophy. And he was uh, the, the Soviet Union, one of the, one of the founders of the Soviet Union that was led by this Marxism that ultimately led to their communist regime that was responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths because they wanted to gain control. And the only way they could gain control was by bringing the people under subjection and whoever did not want to comply received a death penalty. And then 
that led when Lenin died, then Joseph Stalin took over and he continued this barbaric practice and genocide was being committed in the Soviet Union that carried over past World War II. And then you have Miles, great famine that happened in Cambodia, responsible for over a million lives. This philosophy, this control, this, 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 this uh, power that they were built on cost millions of lives. And look at this, not only that, no, no, this was, uh, Mao's was, was China and communism, and then Pol Pot was Cambodia. Cambodia's over a million people uh, lost their lives to these oppressive regimes that were led by these philosophies. Millions of lives. Matter of fact, I was reading a report that from 1900 all the way to like 2014, some 150 million people lost their lives under communist regimes. 150 million people lost their lives to this genocide, this genocidal philosophy. These are the, that's why at the beginning I say deadly doctrines because it literally costs 150 million lives to be sacrificed because of these philosophies. And how many of us know about these things? And I, I wish there was more I can go into the history of the Holocaust. Y'all know Nazi, Nazism, y'all remember Adolf Hitler? How many Jews were killed during the Holocaust? Six million because of a philosophy, because of an ideology, because of a way of thinking, because they wanted government control because they wanted to, to, to exile certain people groups that didn't align to what they wanted. And many people died. These are the results. We have to be careful with these things. And now some of these influences have come right into America today, masquerading itself as other little fancy names. And we don't even know it. We don't even see it. Look at the magnitude of genocides between 1955 and 2014. You know, the darker, the darker the purple, the more people were lost. And you can see right here, the Soviet Union and China, right there. China is probably the one country that's responsible for the most genocide in all of history. China, yep. A lot of people think Europe. Europe's not even close to China. Yep, and, and in, in these countries right here in Africa, Yep, a lot of those countries are Islam. Islam, communist ran. All about control and power. And, and let's, not, let's not just look at these philosophies as the reason why the world is where it's at. What happened with the church? The church got caught up in its own religious wars. And then what happened was people were looking on the outside, what's going on with the church? So they were starting to look for something more. So the church was fighting each other. Okay, and people wanted to separate themselves from religion. That's why I'm bringing back to the forefront intentional discipleship. Because all of those religious wars that were occurring weren't built on intentional discipleship. Jesus never commanded to go, go to war with your, own, with your own people. Sin. Sin. David. Yes. In regards to that map that you just showed up, I just pulled up the map on Voice of the Martyrs and every single one of those countries there, are, yeah. uh, Christians are being persecuted for faith. They're being persecuted. Listen, look, I Sometimes have, uh, most of them are hostile states. I, yeah, thank you. In Open Doors USA, Voice of the Martyrs has all of the statistics of Christians being persecuted around the world. China is one of them still to this day, Nigeria. Christians are still getting their heads cut off because of these regimes, these oppressive regimes, you know? And then here go, here go another, another a link right here, our world data and genocides. Look at this. And, and I wanna show you the statistic all the way on the bottom, historical genocides. Let's see here. You went too far, I think. Did I go too far? Did I go too far? Okay, I may have went too far. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Come on, Lord, where is, where is this Where is this statistic at? Bear with me. Bear with me. These are, these are some of the causes right here. Governmental power, as we talked about before. Oh, 
Okay, here we go right here. Here goes some, I learned a new word, democide. Democide is actually the government committing genocide against the people. That's a new word, democide. And uh, I, can't, I can't find the actual statistic. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought I had it. It was somewhere in here. I wanted to show you guys. Oh, I'm so sad. I hate when that happens, when I try to find something and I can't find it. Oh, here we go, right here. The <laughs> impacts of genocide on life expectancy. Look at this, the Cambodia. Y'all remember the, the movie Rwanda? Rwanda, there was a huge genocide that occurred then. Both experienced terrible genocides in the second half of the 20th century. The Cambodian genocide carried out by the Rouge under dictator Pol Pot led to the deaths of between 1.5 and 2 million people from 1975 to 1979. Just five years, 2 million people lost their lives all to a philosophy. Think about it, that's why it's so deadly. And then the Rwandan genocide in 1994, man, I can only watch it. There's certain movies like The Passion of Christ can only like watch that twice because it's just that vivid. And that, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Hurtful and, and just sad that, you know, and, and that movie, that documentary on the Rwandan genocide was so tragic and terrible, all off of a philosophy. So um, going back to the presentation here. Awesome, awesome, praise the Lord. This is why intentional discipleship is so important. One disciple for Christ is one less disciple for Satan who's being followed by these worldly philosophies, okay? This is why it's so important. And here are some reasons why discipleship is important. It teaches us how to be a true follower of Jesus Christ how to deny ourselves. It teaches us about the spiritual battle. As soon as Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail, what happens? Once Peter makes that confession, once Jesus gives him the keys to the church, we see the enemy immediately afterwards, where, where Jesus now having a look at Peter says, get thee from behind me, Satan. Immediately afterwards, we see Satan attacking. Discipleship teaches us about worldly philosophies and false doctrines. Jesus multiple times says, beware of false prophets, false doctrines, false prophets, I mean, false apostles in Christ. Also, Paul warned the same thing numerous of times. That's why I say repetition, repetition, repetition. They were repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Be careful with these things because they existed during their time. Discipleship teaches us about the absolute truth of Jesus' gospel and the scriptures. Discipleship teaches us to learn from our history. Jesus quoted multiple times from the Old Testament, actual history. And discipleship teaches us that the ultimate solution to the problems of the world is the Great Commission. That's it. If the church would just all jump on board with exercising the Great Commission, I truly believe the world would be a much better place. If we focused our philosophies on the doctrine of Jesus Christ and what he taught, we'd be a much better country today. And then I have a book here, Diedrich Bonhoeffer that I said I was gonna quote, and he wrote this during Nazi Germany. And this is what he said. He said, nothing less than a return to the Christian faith could save Germany nothing less and the same thing i'm defending in my thesis today nothing less than a return back to the true meaning of the christian faith teaching intentional discipleship and exercising the great commission could save america from the darkest recess of moral relativism not these social justice movements that we have in our world today that's not centered on Christ. So the challenge to the saints today, the challenge to our online viewers today is I dare you to be a disciple. That's the challenge. I dare you to be a true follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I challenge you to be born again. I challenge you to deny any tradition that are not of God and to come to the real truth of Jesus Christ 
and repent and confess. That's what I challenge you guys today. We need more disciples. We don't need Christians just calling them Christians by title and not by deed. And I love this slide here because it says disciple, be one, make one. But I love this arrow because discipleship is supposed to be reciprocal. It's supposed to be reciprocal. Look, Jesus taught the disciples for how many years? For three okay. years. And then what did he do after he made them true disciples and true followers? He told them to go. Now it's your turn to go reciprocate the disciple making process. That's what disciple is. We can't just be disciples, sit on our pews and not go make disciples. Now for everyone, it's different. God calls us to a multitude of different platforms and contexts, right? So you may work at your particular job. You may work for sanitation. You may work at a legal office or you may work for the government. How many of us are praying, God, use me today. Let your will be done in my life. Allow me to testify to the goodness of Jesus Christ. Allow me to preach your word in the way that you have called me to do it, right? So we can all testify to the goodness of God. We can all proclaim that Jesus Christ is alive. He's risen. And if you don't repent from your sins, guess what? There's only one place for those who reject him. Okay? You don't need a fancy theological degree to go out and proclaim the good news. Fill your mind with God's word and you will have no room for Satan's lies. Be led by the absolute truth of God's word. Don't be afraid to let God's word change you. That's what it's supposed to do. Amen. It's supposed to transform you through and through. God wants you to be sanctified, purified, transformed, and made holy through and through your whole life. Mind, body, soul. Down to your politics. Even my politics have changed. Not because I had some fancy feeling and emotion about certain things, but because I actually meditated on his word and I actually examined real policy. And I said, well, that policy ain't in alignment with God's word. So guess what? Can't go with that. Everything about my life has been transformed by God's word. I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Whoever has an ear, if you have an ear today, let them hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Jesus spoke to seven churches in the book of Revelation from chapter 2 to chapter 3. And at the end of the message to each church, he says the same thing over and over again seven times. Whoever has an ear, as believers, are we listening with the intent to apply it? Whoever, whoever has an ear, some of us don't have an ear. No matter how many times we preach the truth, some of us just will not follow it. We will not apply it. Don't let that be you. And all of those verses are there. Revelation 2.7, Revelation 2.11. Revelation 2.17, Revelation 2.29, Revelation 3.6, Revelation 3.13, Revelation 3.22. Jesus felt the need to repeat the same verse seven times. The number of completion. My goodness. <laughs> the word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to soul and marrow, to the joints. It gets down to the inner part of your heart. Let it change you. Don't let traditions hold you back from being a true follower. Look, so as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Don't do as the Israelites did back in the days. 
They hardened their hearts in the wilderness multiple times. Even after God delivered them with miraculous signs and wonders, he split the Red Sea. He delivered them with 10 plagues. Then they had the nerve to go and build a golden calf because Moses took too long to come down the mountain. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. Be still. Don't take matters into your own hand. What a wonderful example that is. Yes, I told you I was going to get a lot of word today. Psalm 1933, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, your ways. Don't teach me my ways, because my ways are going to lead me down a ditch. Teach me your ways, your word, that I may follow it to the very end. And last but not least, what time I got? Huh? 829. I'm right on time. My last slide. Praise the Lord. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. The Great Omission by Dallas Willard. And I say, be careful of the misconception mentioned on page 11 of this book. And it says the governing assumption today among professing Christians is that we can be Christians forever and never become disciples. That's the great omission, the great misconception that I can be a Christian and not be connected to the body of Christ, not be connected to the church. Jesus is coming back for his bride. If you're not connected to the body of Christ, to his church, you on the outside. Think about it. What was the purpose of Jesus building a church on a rock? If you didn't have to be part of the church, where two or three are gathered in his name, he is in the midst. The early believers in Acts chapter 2 gathered together every day of the week. Every day. We struggled to gather together during COVID. I'm sorry. I know some churches are closed. I get that. But the struggle is real right now just to come to church and gather together with like-minded believers, the most powerful spiritual institution in the world. Because we have fell for Satan's lies. And last but not least, I want to read you a clip out of my thesis. And when it comes to the cost of discipleship, Von Hoffner said, as I quoted before, nothing less than a return to the Christian faith could save Germany. Same with us. And same thing as this research project is proposing that only a retreat from the age of moral relativism back to the living word of God could save America from her potential moral demise. Nothing less than a return back to the true meaning of the Christian faith teaching intentional discipleship and exercising the Great Commission could save America from the darkest recesses of moral relativism, all right? And additionally, in this book here, there was a, there was a memoir written by Leibholz, Leibholz, okay? That's a fancy name there he got. And he says, beyond that, we know that the time will come when we shall have to realize that we owe it to the inspiration of what he wrote Dietrich Bonhoeffner's life and death and of those who died with them, that Western civilization can be saved. For not only in its material standards, but also in its spiritual vitality, has Western civilization been failing steadily and with increasing rapidity, uh, rapidity into ruin and destruction. That was a quote. And I say, notice that this memoir by Dietrich Bonhoeffner was written in Europe approximately after the conclusion of World War II when America was dealing with its own issues of segregation, overcoming the, great, the, uh, overcoming the Great Depression, along with the landmark case of Everson versus the Board of Education that catapulted a multitude of Supreme Court cases, which we talked about last week, erecting the wall of separation of church and state into jurisprudence, which further plunged America into moral unrighteousness. 
von Hoffner's sentiment, sentiment that only a return back to the Christian faith could save a nation from more ruin was true then, how much more now that America has practically exterminated Jesus Christ out of the public square. If this was true then, that only a return back to the Christian faith would save Germany, how much more today? that we completely exile God out of, out of our public institutions. And then look at this, just consider the immoral fruit America's currently reaping right now after exiling God and his moral law to include an increase as we talked about public mass shootings, the appalling statistics on abortion, the broad range of sexual depravity, the many violent protests across the country, the partisan civil war we're currently experiencing, the idolatrous devotion to entertainment, the practice of euthanasia, along with the expansion of liberal and progressive influence that is drastically reshaping this country. Think about it. The immoral fruit that we're reaping right now in America has not morally improved over the years since God, since God was removed out of the public equation. The manifestation of decades worth of academic indoctrination that has fictitiously erected a wall of separation of church and state has now raised a whole generation of young minds that are taking the secular bull by the horns who are emoting themselves in a more aggressive tone that is unprecedented, dangerous, and uncontrollable. This is where we are. We have a whole generation growing up under this immorality. And what is the solution? What is the solution? The only solution is to return back to teaching intentional discipleship, to get back to exercising the Great Commission, and to get back to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. That is the solution. And that concludes this class. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I ran a little bit over today. I still want to take your questions. Summary, we reviewed the two books that we had here on the table. We talked about being transformed, what it means to be a new creation. We talked about being careful with ungodly traditions. We talked about spiritual contributions continued uh, of the statement of problem. We talked about worldly philosophies and the results of those world, worldly philosophies and the importance of re-emphasizing intentional discipleship. That's what we talked about today. It was a lot, wasn't it? But you guys made it, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's a lot of information, I know it. And, and think about it, and I'm having to condense all of this into an hour and a half, into an hour and a half, each session. So I pray that you guys learned a lot from this course so far. And I pray that what you guys receive, you will put it into practice in your own life and be careful with what Satan is trying to do. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for just your love and, and your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, your absolute truth your word that you preserved for thousands of years so we can have access to it today, so we can distinguish between falsehood and, and, and your truth and your word. So God, I just pray that as we leave here today, but never away from your presence, that you will continue to grow us, that we will continue to understand what it means to be a true follower, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, and that we will continue to open our hearts and our minds to receive your word that will transform us through and through because your word is truth. And we pray that you will sanctify us by your truth. So God, continue to be with us, continue to grow us, continue to lead us and guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We love you and we thank you so much for every single blessing you bestowed on us. To all of our online viewers who are receiving this teaching today, I pray that you will continue to anoint them, Lord, and that they will apply this teaching also in their individual life. So Lord, we love you and we thank you so much. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.